Aloha and welcome to all of you who are joining us. We really appreciate you making the time to be here live and hello to everyone on the archive. So I do want to officially start us off. Um, we are here together for the 2023 OLP series, Chinese Online Language Pedagogy. And this is a series that when I first heard about it, I was very excited to be part of. So thank you all to our panelists and our participants for joining us. We really appreciate your time. To give a little bit of background on this particular series, we've been doing the OLP series for quite some time now at NFLRC, but this year we're taking a little bit of a different focus, which is very exciting. And our primary focus this year is solely on teaching Mandarin Chinese in an online environment. And with that direction, that's a little different where we normally do something a little bit more general, we're really focusing down on the needs of what do Mandarin Chinese teachers in the online world face? We want to try to create things that are going to help you. And so I hope those of you who are practitioners of teaching Chinese in an online environment, I really hope this is a webinar series that will be very useful for you. And I hope you'll have some great takeaways from this. And in an effort to start, we did send out a very wide reaching survey to educators of all levels of Mandarin Chinese in that online environment. We also had a focus group as well. And these areas that we'll be covering in our series are the big areas that we were told that teachers want more of. So they wanna learn more about resources and assessment and interaction in these online environments. And so that's what we plan to bring you over the next several days here. And again, we're very glad to have you with us. So I want to start off by quickly sharing my screen because I want to show you our online website if you haven't seen this already. But there's some great resources here for you. It basically just goes through and explains all the times, gives you several time zones in case those of you are not joining us from the States. Hopefully you'll be able to find the time zone that works for you. And just some reminders about the days and times and the format as well. We've also got our panelists listed here for everyone. And I did want to draw everyone's attention to the option to potentially earn a digital badge and maybe even a CEU that you might be able to use to renew your license if you are a practicing educator. Um, definitely check with your local agencies to make sure that you'd have clearance to use this, but it's definitely a possibility for you, just depending on what your local agency requires. So the digital badge can be issued to everyone who goes through and completes our several days of workshop, attends all three of the live sessions, participates in these asynchronous texts that we'll have coming up. These are going to be done in Padlet. We'll also have three, two, one reflections for you to complete and an exit survey. And there will also be some fun hands-on activities to do as well. Personally, my vision for that is to hopefully give true educators of Chinese in this online environment some things they can take with them and potentially implement in their classroom next year. So rather than this being one of those webinars that people kind of passively listen to and might or might not implement a few things, my hope is that I'm able to kind of have you go through these exercises and kind of as a gift to you, give you a lesson you might actually be able to use in an oncoming year to kind of spice things up a little bit in your classroom. So I did want to draw your attention to that. And if you are interested in earning the badge and or the credit potentially for the CEU, please be sure that those activities are completed by July 15th, 2023. So that way we can get you credit for that in a timely manner. And then the next thing I wanted to do was to very briefly introduce you to this wide variety of talent that we have on our panel. As soon as I saw the bios come in for our panelists this year, I was really blown away. And I think everybody is going to be quite happy with the folks who were selected. I think this is one of our best panels to date, and I really look forward to working with this group. So I'll just go ahead and share my screen. So our first panelist, and going in no particular order, everybody really has a lot to bring to the table. And again, I'm very excited to be working with this group. Our first panelist is Ying Jin, and she is an instructor at Cupertino High School. She teaches level one all the way up through advanced placement. And she's got a 20 year history of teaching Chinese. So lots of experience to draw from. And you can see that she was the CLTA teacher of the year in 2016. 
the SWCOLT Teacher of the Year in 2017, and then in 2018, she was awarded the actual Teacher of the Year, so quite an honor there. She holds a MA in Instructional Technologies from San Francisco State University and a BA in Chinese Language and Literature from Keqing University in China. Our next panelist is Kay Peng, and she is the director of the Chinese Flagship Program and professor of Chinese at Western Kentucky University. And she teaches all levels of modern Chinese language, also does second language acquisition and teaching methods of foreign languages, content courses on Chinese culture, history, and literary Chinese from the advanced to the superior level. She holds a doctorate in Chinese linguistics with a focus on second language acquisition and teaching from the University of Arizona, as well as a master's in foreign language education from Indiana University. Our next panelist is Terry Waltz. Terry is the author of TPRS with Chinese Characteristics. She has many unique contributions, including cold character literacy for non-Roman alphabet, L2 reading, the top system of tonal spelling, and directional gestures for reinforcement of tone, knowledge, and performance. She holds a master's in conference interpreting from Fujian Catholic University and also a doctorate in applied linguistics for language education from the University of Texas at Austin. And we also have Penny Wong with us. She is the editor, researcher, translator, and bilingual writer and online course developer. She's the editor-in-chief of the Handbook of Research on Foreign Language Education in the Digital Age. She is the associate lead of the Chinese Language Teachers Association USA. She is the EdTech SIG in that. And she's also the vice president of the Iowa Chinese Language Teachers Association. She holds a master's in bilingual ELL education. She also holds a doctorate in language liter literacy and technology from Washington State University. So I'm sure all of our participants are very excited to start things off with this group. And like I said, we really have a lot of talent here. The way that I have this envisioned for the way that our sessions will work is we are going to start off with a round of questions for our panelists. And as the participants, we definitely do want to hear from you. So please do feel free during this portion to type in the chat and share some thoughts. We might also bring some of those items into the fold as the conversation kind of organically moves around. And then it's our hope that toward the end of our session that we will be able to kind of turn things over to our participants. And if you have questions you'd like to ask, if you're feeling like you want to turn on your web camera or your microphone, we definitely would warmly invite you to do that if you've got some questions or things that you'd like to address with our panel. And ultimately, we hope that you are going to get a lot out of this. I am very, very excited to work with this group. Um, just very quickly also to introduce myself. Hello, for those of you who don't know me, I am Sarah Booten. This is my, I think this is my fifth or sixth year at this point facilitating the online language pedagogy website workshops where NFLRC and we always have so much fun with this group. And I get a lot of great feedback from all of our participants. We really try to gear this toward those who are practitioners of online language and teaching language online. So this is kind of our own little space. We love having all of you. And I do wanna also emphasize that even though I am kind of a person on your screen, I am in fact a real person. I will be sharing with you my contact information. So if you have questions, concerns, anything that comes up during the webinar series, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I am here to serve you and make this a great experience for all of you. So I wanna go ahead and dig right into our questions. And again, this is a fantastic group, really looking forward to working with all of you. And we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I do kind of want to have a break as well, just so everybody can get up, stretch our legs kind of after the first hour-ish. We'll kind of play it by ear, see whenever we want to get that break in, but we won't be sitting for a full, the full session. We'll have a little bit of a break in there just so everybody can kind of plan accordingly for that. Well, that being said, I want to go ahead and get into our first round of questions. And so this particular webinar session, we are going to be focusing more on looking for resources, handling resources, and just having a general discussion, because that was quite possibly the hot topic that online educators really wanted to talk about. And so I want to go ahead and start off with our very first question. Again, this is from the lens of looking for resources. And I want to ask the first question that is, what aspects of Mandarin Chinese do you think are most challenging to teach online? Um, and then just kind of going along with our group, I'm going to go ahead and start off by passing that over to Wang Laoshi, if you want to go ahead and start us off, please. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, that is a very good question. Um, so I think the to practice to make a conversation in a context and in a cultural appropriate manner is pretty challenging for students to learn Mandarin Chinese online. Uh, as you know, in a face-to-face -face lesson, you can use body languages. Uh, you can demonstrate. Uh, how to you know uh, hold a conversation in a cultural context. Um, you can also act it out in person. You can walk around in the classroom, but in an online class, um, it is kind of limited by the space of your computer screen, your tablet, uh, your phone screen, even the Wi-Fi speed may affect. So the limitation of the device and technology itself may reduce the effectiveness of the lessons. So I think that put you know a challenge to students to, to grasp that some of the you know the uh, the culture uh, part of you know the language uh, when you when you do teach online versus the teaching in the classroom. I would definitely agree with that. There is that kind of artifact that you're dealing with. You're actually having to have students go through another medium on top of that. So that is a really good point. Can you share any stories or anything in particular where you've been able to help students who maybe are really struggling with that aspect overcome it? Um well, that, that's a that's a good, a very good follow up question. Um, uh, there's uh, when I do the online and they try to create a little bit kind of uh, um, context. For example, when I teach the beginning level class and uh, there's a lot of vocabulary related to food, um, ordering food, um, I think we try to envision that, you know, your um, students are at home, they are, have easy access to our kitchen, to their, you know, uh, fridge. So I would, you know, have a very mini task for when they learn the vocabulary and have a discussion and say, hey, can you find something you like, you enjoy eating, and then just grab five items. And then, okay, let's do in pairs. And so can you create a small kind of conversation and you can use, you know, kind of move, over, you know, your cameras, you know, having the face, you know, to, a, you know, maybe your kitchen and show us what you make for lunch or dinner. So that creates a little bit kind of those contacts that is quite authentic. And then they can apply, you know, like the new word they learn, the expressions, but they can also, you know, practice in a more, more meaningful way. And that's kind of like a compensation on that, you know, without, you know, a real human, you know, interactions, you know, in person. Definitely. And also a great way to build those connections, actually talking about what are you doing? How are you, what are you working on? How are you, what are you eating for lunch today? Again, building those connections in that online environment. So fantastic. And that's very creative. Something to think about. Definitely. I appreciate that. Fantastic. I'll pass the next, well, the same question. I'll just pass the same question and I'll go to uh, Peng Lao Shi. And the question again was, what aspects of Mandarin Chinese do you think are most challenging to teach online? So this is a great question. And I also agree with uh, Wang Lao Shi on some of the aspects she mentioned. Um, it depends how we approach this question pedagogically, if you're talking about pronunciation, right, the speaking part, the um, interaction with students to um, maintain the conversation in class. So that's, uh, I think if we start with uh, freshmen or the, the novice students, the pronunciation is the first challenge, how to, to uh, practice uh, pronunciation when we are not uh, in the face to, traditional face-to-face -face, uh, manner. And another challenge may be how to keep the target use of uh, uh, the, the use of target language uh, over 90% uh, throughout the class. So that's another challenge. Um, and another challenge may have to do with literacy skills like reading characters and writing characters, practicing them and um, uh, typing them even um, pick uh, selecting the right characters. So that's from the pedagogical side. But these days I'm thinking more from the student experience uh, perspective. How do you uh, maintain students' interest uh, and make sure that the time management uh, in the classroom is, um, is effective so that uh, you, at, while you are uh, trying to uh, engage students uh, in individualized learning, uh, and provide um, feedback, uh, immediate or uh, constructive feedback to uh, maintain their interest. So they will keep coming back to continue the, their uh, Chinese learning uh, process. Um, 
in terms of the solution, uh, I think uh, there are two things I did in the past uh, couple of years. One is to have students um, building the uh, frequent and early success uh, experiences for students. So after, uh, after to fill, flip the class, uh, after they watch the videos, still have um, some of our tutors and assistants or sometimes language partners from China or from Taiwan uh, to engage students in 10 or 15 minutes um, comprehension checks every week. I think that's very helpful. Uh, another one is to still engage students in cultural pro uh, projects. So for example, how to uh, make your uh, tomato uh, and the egg dish, how to make boba tea, how to, um, how to just bring in the cultural elements in the classroom. So these are my um, ideas. Thank you. Excellent. Those are really good points and especially kind of digging a little bit deeper into what you brought up about pronunciation. And I can imagine, I personally, I'm not a, a teacher of Mandarin Chinese. I did try to very briefly try to learn a few things and the learning how to speak in tones was extremely challenging for me, even though I had a lot of background with other languages. And in an online environment too, especially, I would think that would be really challenging. Are there any particular ways and means that you deal with struggles with tone and pronunciation whenever you're in that online environment? It depends on the student's uh, learning style. Some students are really analytical. So if you show them the visual of the, the, their pitch and the sound, record them and show them, okay, so this is the ideal situation. This is how native speakers pronounce, and this is your pronunciation. So it works for some students, but it doesn't work for other students. Other students don't need to know explicitly uh, which part I made a mistake. Uh, what they want is to uh, create some stories or to have them uh, come up with mnemonics, how to pronounce the, the, the pronunciation. Again, I think even at the very stage of uh, beginning stage of learning pronunciation, stories and student interest, their input, their perspective really helps. Definitely. And it is very helpful to have that differentiated instruction. As we know very well as online educators, it's not one size fits all. Some students are going to need some different things. So I love having different approaches for different students. I definitely think that's very helpful and it's a very unique way to address that particular nuance of learning Mandarin Chinese as tone is so important. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And then again, passing the next question, this time we'll go to Waltz Laoshi. And again, the question was, what aspects of Mandarin Chinese do you think are most challenging to teach online? Well, I would love to jump on our last answer and say boba tea because it's my favorite, but I'm not going to do that. Um, actually, what I find to be the most challenging to teach online is reading. And that's kind of a, a technical issue, I think, because um, the biggest problem for me is getting enough text that's available. To preface this, I am a straight 100% CI teacher, comprehended input, uh, also sometimes called acquisition driven instruction these days. I can't keep up with the acronyms. But basically, if, if you haven't heard of that, what it is in my five second elevator speech is I'm flooding my students with Mandarin that they can understand from the first day. So part of that flood is text. But the problem is that it's really hard to find a large volume of text for novice level or even intermediate level learners, really, when you're still below, say, 200 character level, really hard to find interesting things. Uh, let alone things that are at the paragraph level and which are long. Um, and by long, we, for unit one, we have students reading over 8,000 characters of running text. So it's significantly longer than what we traditionally would think of as a a brief reading passage in a book. Uh, so that's my biggest thing. Um, the other side of that, and I probably didn't think of this before I started writing books, but now I do, is copyright. Because if I buy a copy of a book, maybe it's a fantastic book, but does buying that copy give me the legal right to display it through an electronic means? I don't know. You know I'm really not a copyright lawyer, but it's something to think about. 
um, because educational fair use only goes so far. So that's the biggest thing. And as far as pedagogy and reading, the biggest challenge for me is the one-on-one -on -one comprehension checks. I want to know that every one of my students is reading and comprehending every word of this text exactly the way the meaning should be. But it's difficult if you've got a group of people online and you breakout rooms only go so far and it's, it's a challenge. It's an ongoing challenge that I'm trying to solve, but I can't say I've come to any, you know, 100% solutions yet. Maybe next year. <laughs> I can definitely relate to the feeling of not having found the perfect solution just yet. And that's kind of part of the craft of educating others because it's trying to tinker with what works. And this might work great for this group, but for the other group, it didn't work at all. But do you have anything in particular you want to share with us? You'd mentioned breakout rooms, but maybe some strategies that you are working with and exploring now to try to meet those challenges of getting that one-on-one -on -one comprehension check in. Well, basically, I keep my group small. I have the luxury of doing that because I teach privately. Um, when I taught in, in public schools, which I did at levels from middle school, high school, college, um, and adults too, the strategy for that is to basically differentiate your reading by giving them different reading tasks. You're going to know within a couple of readings who is a quicker reader and who's a slower reader, just to say. I don't want to say better achiever is worse. It's just people acquire at different paces. So I'm going to take my better readers, quote unquote, and maybe give them an independent reading task. Maybe I'll say to them, read this passage, the same thing, to each other or use some of the reading games that we have set up. Meanwhile, that frees me to be able to work one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with the people who are having more difficulty. And that works online as well. You, know, you can do it with breakout rooms. The question is, how do you get everyone on task without spending 20 minutes figuring out who gets what resources and like that? But yeah, that's basically it, is to try to get a model going where everyone has something useful and meaningful to do, but it frees up the teacher's attention to deal with students who need a little more support. Excellent. And absolutely. Having that one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one kind of the pair work, I find is also very helpful in those types of situations. So thank you for sharing that. Let me, let me just clarify quickly. When I said one-on-one, -on -one, I did not mean pair work. I meant okay. me working with students directly. I don't sure. use any pair work. Yeah. Perfect. Just, just so nobody says, Walt said. <laughs> Definitely understandable. And one other thing, whenever you said, you know, I'm not a copyright lawyer, I can certainly relate because I'm also not a copyright lawyer. And we have to be so careful and mindful, especially in an online environment. We're kind of a fishbowl in a way, just because anybody can randomly show up and so-and-so's uncle is a copyright lawyer for such and such company and might notice something. So we do have to be very careful about that. Um, our good folks at NFLRC, I'm sure would be able to help us out pointing us to the resource, but we do have in prior webinar series, we have done extensive work on copyright and being mindful about that. And they might be able to point all of us to a great resource. If I could maybe put you on the spot a little bit, folks, and if you can pop that into the chat, that'd be appreciated. Um, and I did have a question come in that I think might be worth discussing. I, I don't want to go too deep into the rabbit hole of artificial intelligence and chat GPT, but the question came up about potentially using resources like this to create some of those texts that are maybe a little bit hard to find organically, but ChatGPT might be able to pull up in a matter of a minute or two. Have you had any experience working with anything like that? Um, I'm sorry, you're asking me or the panel? I just want to make sure. Oh, it, just panel. going back to you, uh, Walt Slauchy. Oh, okay. Um, I have tried ChatGPT. It's a very intriguing tool very interesting, but I have had no success with it in getting it to reproduce the kind of text that I want for my novice readers. These are my baby readers. It has to be 100% comprehensible to them, which means not only controlling, you know, it, 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 tightly controlling the vocabulary that's used. So chat GPT, I've actually told it, write me a story with these plot points using these words. So this was taken from a story I'd actually written as a human. And it couldn't do it. It kept going out of bounds on the words. So, so far, not yet, but who knows? You know, these things are developing by leaps and bounds. So who knows? It I is think a it, variant. We always have to curate them, though, with our eyes. 
Absolutely. It is a very interesting topic and a very interesting tool. And it's interesting to say that you are finding it's not quite there yet, which is kind of what I'm hearing from other folks, but who knows exactly as you said. Fantastic. Thank you for the insight. And uh, passing the same question now, and this would be to uh, Jin Laoshi. And the question again is, what aspects of Mandarin Chinese do you think are most challenging to teach online? Um, before answering that, can I just add a little bit on what, you know, the conversation you just had uh, with- Please Pat. do. Uh, I think I tried uh, chat GPT with kind of like same kind of thoughts. Uh, you know, this is the topic, here are the words, but I added one more thing. I said, write something for uh, grade one students. So I think, yeah, with that, actually, I think I got more, you know, I don't know, appropriate, or, but, but definitely what, when I tried it, I was uh, looking for material for my AP students. It's different from, you know, novice students. But I think what I saw, I actually, I was happy and I shared what I found from as uh, chat GPT with other AP teachers. And I think people, people think it's pretty good. We had a discussion. Sorry, maybe I should save it for the last question, but we were talking about authentic materials uh, are what we want to use in our teaching, right? Is material generated by chat GPT authentic material? <laughs> and I, thought about it and, and I think I personally think it's, it is well it's close enough because I don't think when chat GPT did that did its work it had the, the idea that I'm doing this for you know second language learners right and well maybe I can it, it, it's a long you know um it's a topic we, we we're going to uh, dig more but I will come back to your question, Sarah, sorry. Um, my online teaching experience was primarily when we did online teaching in 2020 and 2021 school year. And I think my student um, background uh, is a little different from uh, uh, Peng Laoshi, Wang Laoshi and uh, Ke Laoshi. I'm teaching high school. So we're talking about 30 plus students in you know, like one Zoom class. And, and we're talking about teenagers who are still learning how to self, you know, uh, discipline, you know, um, keep the uh, motivation going, keep focus, all of those. So I want to say, um, I think the most challenging aspect is how to give timely feedback. Because I think uh, for me, <laughs> on the Zoom, giving feedback to each individual student. I, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's really hard. I can, of course, ask my students to, uh, you know, pronounce or to show me this or that one by one, but it takes forever. So I think that was the one um, I struggled a lot. And <laughs> I really feel sorry because I, I feel like I didn't give them enough individual attention. And yeah, and solution, <laughs> for now, I don't have a very good solution. The only thing I did was I just asked students to come to my office hour. You know, I set up, you know, certain time slots, 10 minutes for this student, then next student, next student. But definitely I miss, I know how much I missed my classroom, you know, during that year, because in a real classroom, I can just easily walk to a student. You know, I can listen to students, you know, talking simultaneously, like, oh no, and I can give them feedback right away. I have heard that echoed by many people, especially during the pandemic when folks who were not online teachers before all of a sudden became online teachers within the span of two weeks. So it was very challenging and, you know, I hats off to all of you who were in that boat because I think it was tremendous, the challenges that you went through, but you rose to meet it and that is fantastic. So hats off for that. If you compare your time whenever you first started online teaching and when you were giving feedback to your students toward the end of the pandemic, when 
the online learning was starting to become a little bit more of a new normal for you. What do you think was different if you compare the very beginning to the very end? Do you think it went a little bit easier the more you got the practice in, or do you think you saw a lot of the same challenges? Yeah, I think I remember the date when we were told to go home, and it was just actually my, I I was on campus, and you know my principal made that announcement, and immediately I could hear students were yelling, they were like happy cheering, and they they, they were they were happy to go home. And they thought they would come back right away. No, not, not you know, they stayed online for one year. And we, we, I mean, students were happy, but I think teachers were really frustrated. We didn't know what to do, especially I think for language teachers. Um, I have a colleague who is a uh, math teacher, you know, in my school. And her partner is actually my department lead. And this uh, math teacher made a comment saying that I was not aware of that, how much interaction you guys, you know, for language teachers, you guys have with your students. I think for some subjects, you can just assign, you know, a chapter to read, write a reflection. But for us, we, we just need to be there with our students every minute, right? And I think at the beginning, I had no clue what to do. But luckily, I had a group of, you know, um, teachers, colleagues, uh, you know, with me, we always shared ideas what to do. And of course, we, we thought about asking students to record, sending their uh, recording either on our LMS or, you know, find a uh, platform like, you know, Seesaw or any uh, websites like that. But my problem is timely because, you know, if they say something which is not correct or not, not uh, accurate, I want to correct them as soon as possible. But this, you know, it just added one more layer. They recorded, we listened, then we sent feedback to them. It just, yeah, and uh, like what I mentioned earlier, at the end, of course, we figured out we could use the office hour, you know, wisely, <laughs> smartly, right? Um, but I think, yeah, that that I can say it's a big, step forward but for me it's not a big I mean a step big enough to really support my students understandable and again hats off for just jumping in and being willing to meet that challenge it was a very challenging time and and I think we kind of all banded together and we made it work in our own way so thank you for that fantastic moving on to our next question and this one we will start with Peng Laoshi and this question is, how do you help students learn characters? You know, if I think about learning I, really any uh, logographic language, there is a challenge to that, as most of our students are more comfortable with the Roman alphabet, and now we're giving them an entirely new writing and reading system. So how do you help overcome those challenges of learning characters? Uh, so there are, I, I think... Um... There are different ways to teach uh, reading and writing Chinese characters. Oh, for my class, I know there are some uh, teachers out there, they are just uh, teaching students to type. They are not uh, really requiring students to learn how to write characters uh, in the right uh, stroke order by hand. So I'm still doing the tra uh, traditional way. Um, so I, I still require students um, to write uh, to to learn how to read and write uh, the um, how to say the stroke orders and how to the configurations of Chinese characters. So um, I for of course I want to make the material more interactive. So sometimes uh, for the first probably three units or three uh, uh, modules, it will be a combination of uh, pinyin and Chinese characters. Uh, if they have learned the characters, then they need to be able to uh, read, recall, and uh, write the character. Uh, so that's one way to control how much um, uh, characters they can read by what time to um, really introduce speaking and listening at the uh, beginning and delay the character instruction. So that's one of the uh, things that I did. Uh, another one is uh, when students are writing Chinese characters, for example, uh, a uh, Chinese character for, um, for xin, 
face or for a uh, uh, letter. So uh, I still ask them to go to uh, pick a app, maybe it's Playco, Yellow Bridge, to learn the right uh, stroke order. And in class uh, for a period of time, maybe two or three minutes to show each other the key characters if they can write in class to their uh, classmates the, in the uh, correct stroke order. So um, the, the peers will be able to check on each other's um, uh, accuracy in uh, writing the Chinese character. Uh, when it comes to the intermediate level, uh, once students have some uh, uh, character knowledge, then I uh, introduce Chairman Bao. Uh, Chairman Bao has the audio part and the, the reading part, and then there is comprehension checks. So from intermediate level to advanced level, students uh, start to use Chairman Bao to select uh, a few uh, articles they are interested in, and at least they can read one uh, reading uh, every week. Uh, when students are going to the um, intermediate class, I use a, a lot of authentic materials to enrich the class. So it's a time consuming for us, uh, for teachers to annotate all the readings. So um, I use another app called the Pondy Reader to help me translate or to help me to um, provide annotations of the, the pinyin, the simplified and traditional and the, the English um, or the English meaning of each uh, characters. So I use these apps to help students uh, learn to read. But uh, going back to um, what uh, Terry mentioned earlier, uh, students need authentic materials. They need the level appropriate reading materials to maintain their interest. So I think that's the that's the key. How how teachers use the technology to facilitate, to support students uh, in that type of learning. Fantastic. And we did just have, uh, thank you, Jim, for posting those resources that you'd mentioned. For those of you who might want to bookmark that and head out to those, absolutely. I would definitely recommend doing so. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, passing this next, the same question, but we'll pass to, uh, we'll pass to Wang Laoshi. And the question again was, how do you help students learn characters? Um, as you all know, uh, my programs are completely online, so um, I use a lot of tools, uh, including websites, a, a variety of different apps, and uh, videos from social media, et cetera, to enrich students' uh, learning, um, uh, you know, characters um, that... Um, um, so the, the several tools I use, I, I find pretty useful. One is called yellowbridge.com, and Jim has posted that to the chat box. <laughs> So uh, when you go to that website, you will see a function called the animated stroke order rules. Um, I would let students to, um, um, to kind of study. All my classes are hybrid. So the students have to study the, you know, the characters on their own before they come to a class and to do any homework. Um, so they can copy and paste the unknown character into that box. Uh, on that website, and it's going to show the stroke order of each character. So they can, you know, basically have a like a, a teacher showing them how to write, but it really uh, kind of reduces my time, you know, to teach each individual student um, uh, how to write this character, that character, you know, et cetera. And if they still have questions, they can bring their questions to our online discussion. So um, that's how I use the Yellow Bridge. And I find the animated stroke order rules um, the animated videos are pretty useful for students to study on their own at home. Uh, another app that's very useful is called Pleco, and you can download it on your phone. And if you have a touch screen phone, which is very handy. Um, and this one particular app, I think uh, when students go study abroad, they find it's the most useful as they can walk in the street and you know, you know, kind of unknown area to them, and it's totally new, and they see a lot of new things that they have never, you know, really thought about in class. Um, they see this character, they don't have no clue, um, and they don't have a dictionary with them. They can pull up Placo, and then you can handwrite on their touch screen, and it's going to show them all the possible combinations 
and they can look, okay, it's not this one, this one, it's this one, and uh, this is the pronunciation, this is the meaning of it, and it even give you some sample sentences. So Placo helps students to learn, and especially for those travelers and the study abroad, you know, kind of students. Um, so um, I kind of uh, introduced that at the very beginning, uh, uh, of you know the students in the language enrolled in our uh, language certificate program, um. So the, by the time they really try to uh, adapt the language into their working, you know, face they don't feel uh a, you know quite a new. Um. So uh, they already get used to uh, to it and they know how to use it and they don't get just panicked, right on site. Um, other, you know, uh, tools that are resources I use, YouTube is a very good resources, but it has a really a large amount of all kinds of sorts of videos. So I usually um, would have watched a lot of those and select, you know, particular videos I think is a very suitable to my lesson and embedded that. And there are many different ways that you can filter the, you know, the uh, commercials advertisement when you embed into the CMS system. Uh, and there's two videos to show you how to do that on YouTube as well. But YouTube is a really good resource to get a free kind of stuff for students and they can just watch on their phone. Um, there are some um, tools that teachers developed. Uh, I remember there's a very useful tool um, developed by uh, the professor at UC uh, Berkeley. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it's still uh, open to public though. I don't know why, but uh, sometimes uh, those tools can be very useful, but they may only at a you know, certain time may be open to public or to certain school districts. Um, uh, also for, I'm also in charge of the Chinese Language Teacher Association Technology Group. Um, so for our group, we run the online workshops. And so every, uh, you know, um, a few months we would invite a calligrapher um, to come to uh, conduct a demonstration to our members. So some of the events were open to students um, so that the teacher members can um, invite their student to participate. I find that's quite useful um, as some students will see someone more superior and um, to demonstrate how to, you know, how to do like a pen brush and, you know, calligraphy brush and to teach them, you know, the skills. Um, which they couldn't really, uh, you know, do that, uh, or even have, you know, someone um, to uh, give them a one-on-one -on -one instruction, even in the classroom. So we make those online workshops and to help students, uh, especially those that are out of state and they are, um, you know, ha have, you know, away from campus to learn how to write. So those are the main kind of uh, um, method I use to teach students captures online. Excellent. Those are a lot of great ideas, especially bridging that gap when the students aren't physically on campus. They're entirely relying on the internet for the course. Thank you. And again, passing the same question, we will go to Jin Laoshi. And once again, the question was, how do you help students learn characters? Uh, thank you. And I'm so glad to hear what Wang Laoshi just mentioned. I still need my students to practice handwrite characters, especially for lower level. So uh, level one, two, they, they do a lot of handwriting. But, you know, when we move up, uh, my AP students, they, they primarily type, type their work. So when we started the, uh, the Zoom year, uh, this is what I did. Number one, I think I uh, took a look at my uh, all the characters I used to teach in a school year. And I filtered those characters and put them into two categories, core vocab, and basic vocab because I think I knew I wouldn't be able to cover as much as what I used to do in a physical classroom. And number one, <laughs> you know, students had to come to school uh, at the beginning of the school year to pick up their, you know, textbooks, you know. So I told school, besides the textbooks we need for, for level one and level two students, please give each student a little whiteboard and a marker. And, and apparently that was, I think, was a very good decision because it really helped me a lot. And uh, number three is I spent the summer before school started um, to go through all those core vocabs and actually work with other teachers in my school district teaching the same level. 
we just went to websites and download the animated stroke order for each core vocab words. And I think the web, uh, our situation is a little different because in my school district, we have to teach both simplified and traditional. Students choose which one they want to learn, but as teachers, we have to provide both. It was so much time was spent you know, in front of the computer, trying to find stroke order for both simplified and traditional. And uh, we tried different websites, uh, such as uh, Purple Culture and uh, Arch, A-R-C-H, Arch. But eventually we decided to go with a website called Han Zi Pi, H-A-N-Z-I-P-I, because that website has both simplified and traditional. It's, you know, it's like one, and it's free. <laughs> because I, I think uh, purple culture, you have to pay. Or, but that really also saved us a lot of time. When we assign new uh, characters to the students, we always attached those animated files so they could learn by themselves. And I just mentioned the little whiteboard. So that for my Chinese one, it was a routine activity. Like, Get your little whiteboard. I said in Chinese, Xiao Bai Ban, Ma Ke Bi. And, you know, write this character and put it in front of your camera. Show me. And I could give timely feedback. Like, you missed one stroke. You know, or you need to add a little dot here. Um, and that was one thing we did for character learning. And another uh, approach was to use uh, uh, technology tools. The one we used the most, uh, the ones we used the most were uh, Nearpod and Jamboard. Actually, I think any uh, app with a drawing function can serve the purpose. And, you know, it just, I asked them to, to write characters, but using as a like drawing, you, you know what I'm saying? Like to draw a picture, but they actually do uh, characters. Um, and of course, students' feedback is using a computer mouse to draw characters is not very, you know, easy, it's not easy to do. So they actually like the little whiteboard better. You know, like, can we do the little whiteboard instead of the, uh, using the app? But for me, Using an app, I can actually save their work. And I can, you know, uh, later on take a look and maybe I can give feedback uh, in a later time as a class. I think a lot of you missed this character. Let's, you know, reteach this, relearn this. So, you know, that's uh, what I think I did for the character learning during the Zoom year. I love the story about the little whiteboard. It just goes to show that even though we have all this technology, sometimes it's the simple things that work the best and the students have the most fun with it. I love it. Thank you. And now, uh, Walt Slavshi, if I could please get your insight and same question, how do you help your students learn characters? Well, I'm going to start by telling you a short story. And one day, some years ago, back when before COVID, when we could travel and not worry about anything, I stood in front of the Taipei train station. And I stood there for a couple of hours with a clipboard, along with all the people selling insurance and all these other things. And because I was a cute foreigner, I could get people to answer my survey. It was really easy. My survey was, what do you write by hand? Okay. And when all of the dust cleared, there were five things that people wrote by hand. Shopping lists, filling out forms, taking phone messages, writing greeting cards, and if you were a student, writing school assignments. But what's missing from that list? Any kind of extensive writing as an adult in the target culture. So I thought about that and I said, you know, why am I demand or why would I want to demand that all of my students memorize characters to write from hand by memory when most of them will never be called upon to do that in the real world. So the short answer to how do I teach characters is I don't. And that's, I know, I know you're, I'm lucky this is virtual because you're all getting ready to throw things. It's, it's happened in workshops. They're all, they start rumbling in the back row, you know. But 
think about this. What, what we do is we do very extensive reading. So in lesson one, these kids have already read seven, 8,000 characters worth of running text. That's only going to be about 30 unique characters. Okay, it's not like they're learning 150. It's a very small body of characters repeated many, many times in unpredictable contexts because it's in running text, not on flashcards. So while they're doing that, they're also getting reinforcement of syntax, reinforcement of decoding, all these things. But the reason I say that is when we do writing, or at least when I do writing, I'm teaching it using text referenced writing. So when I have them write by hand in class, I say, okay, uh, you know, write me a story based on this picture. And I put some picture up on the overhead or on the thing, whatever it is. And if they're gonna write by hand, I say, if you forget how to write a character, look in your text, find it in your text. And at first, when we started developing this, we, we did six years of this at University of Hawaii, Star Talk. And we thought, they'll just copy sentences from the story that they have, but they didn't. It was very surprising in a way. And so by doing that, we found that they were able to write characters that were indistinguishable being read by native speakers from students who had had instruction in stroke order and had copied and copied like I did in college. I mean, I've got papers and papers full of my handwriting from college and it's pretty. I liked it, but, it, you know, I can't remember those characters now. T.B. Wong, Zhu, that's my middle name. You know, so I don't teach. I just make sure they get plenty, plenty, plenty of reading and then that they go back. And then, of course, we use compositional writing at, to, as our friend in helping to reinforce characters in that my students are taught to edit each other. They're taught how to be a good peer editor. I just really consciously train them. How do I want you to help your partner read his own writing back? What kind of feedback can you give him? So they read their own writing back out loud. And very often, because they've had all this written input, they'll stop in the middle of a sentence and say, that doesn't look right. That doesn't sound right. And they'll correct themselves. Now, it's not 100%, but after 15 days of this, we had students, 15 hours rather, we had students who were able to write between 120 and 190 characters of running text with fewer than two errors. And an error was defined as, I was a little loose on characters. I said, if you missed like one stroke, but I could definitely make out what it was. Okay, you're just novices, fair enough. But also any mistake in syntax, any mistake in word order, placement, word choice, anything. So I was surprised. The results were not perfect. So what I would like to know now is how much traditional type of, of mnemonics or, or rote copying, so to speak, should we add in to hit the sweet spot? Because there's a sweet spot there somewhere that would give us the best return. And I don't know what that is, but someday we'll find out. That's my answer to everything. I don't know, but we'll find out. <laughs> but I've been I very- I couldn't agree more. Character. There is indeed character. that sweet spot somewhere. And I love mm -hmm. the idea about thinking about it. Well, we'll find out. We'll keep doing the research and do things on our end to make that happen. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Appreciate it. So we're going to move on to our next question. And that deals more with, Assessing student interaction with materials. So whenever your students are actually using the materials that we provide you, to them, how do you as teachers assess how those students are actually interacting and using those materials? And uh, we'll shake things up a little bit. We'll go with uh, Jin Laoshi, if you can please share your thoughts. Uh, I have to say my primarily experience on that question is with my AP students. <laughs> And uh, this, well, the Zoom year, of course, we had a lot of frustrations, but also it gave me an opportunity to really reflect on my curriculum. So I actually uh, decided, you know, for that year, I, I wanted to spend the whole year to actually get rid of textbook for my AP course. So, um, well, a lot of, uh, you know, long working hours, a lot of, you know, hair pulling, but I think I'm uh, very glad that I spent, actually I spent time to do that. And I want to say in terms of uh, students' interaction with material, especially authentic materials, um, I think come 
coming up with quality comprehension questions uh, might be a key step. Uh, I used to think, you know, we just just see if they understand. I just come up with questions, say, do you understand the word of this? Do you understand uh, what the main idea of that paragraph? But eventually, I think I was staying in a workshop and got inspired by um, Greta Longard, uh, you know, one of my mentors. And she said, um, make sure when you do comprehension, two things, remember to do two things. Number one is you have floor questions and ceiling questions. You want to start from floor questions, but eventually keep in mind, you want to really uh, help students to think critically critically and you know to really uh, help them to facilitate critical thinking skills and that really helped me to think about questions which you cannot just answer by simply scanning the material and that actually was the fun part when I give them questions like that. And I see their answers that was always like, wow, I never thought about this. And um, I'll give you an example. One uh, chapter we did in the AP class is, uh, you know, the six AP units uh, are, uh, you know, identities, communities, uh, beauty and aesthetic, technology, contemporary life, and global challenges, right? So in the technology uh, unit, I work in Cupertino, you know, the Silicon Valley kids know technology so well, but I want them to think about besides all those advantages, you know, technology brings to, uh, to our life, are there any, I don't want to say bad things, but disadvantages or problems caused by new technology. So we read an article talking about, you know, in, uh, in, in China, uh, people are talking about trying not to use mobile pay at all time. Because uh, one person shared a story by saying that he went to a, you know, just a little, um, how do you call that? A little xiao tanzi, uh, just a, a, a senior lady, you know, having a little, you know, along, how do you say that? Along the street selling stuff, right? So he went to buy something really small and he wanted to pay by using the mobile phone. But the lady said, do you have cash? And he asked why. And she said, because if you use mobile pay, the money will go to my daughter-in-law's bank account. You know, the, the QR code is not related to my bank account because I don't know how to do those mobile pay, you know, those modern things. So this person just posted on social media and encouraging people, always carry some cash in your pocket so you can really help people. When I give that to my students and ask them to think about what kind of things we can do here to really, you know, um, help underserved groups of people, the kids are amazing. <laughs> they just came up with tons of ideas. And those kind of questions I think are needed for in our teaching. It's not just simply, we started from words, you know, uh, sentences, but eventually it's the idea. It's the new thinking we want to put into our kids' mind. And um, so, sorry, I'm back to what I mentioned earlier. One is, to always create floor and ceiling questions. And second is uh, always build a um, activity after interpretive. I realized that I used to just stop after they show me, you know, this is my understanding of this piece of reading or, you know, but you spend so much time to find a good authentic material to generate those good questions. Don't just easily let it go give students a chance to really, you know, uh, go deeper or, you know, um, using different ways to work around that piece of authentic material. So definitely you can do uh, an interpersonal activity, ask students to share their ideas, or you can create a presentation. I, I know we, we're all very creative. We, we can think of a lot of ways to do it, 
but the, totally those two um, suggestions, advices from uh, Greta really helped me to think about how I can help my students to interact, to have a more, you know, effective and more um, in-depth interactions with the material. Excellent. And I appreciate you sharing that with us. It really kind of gets us thinking about new ways we can monitor this. So thank you. appreciate that. And so again, the same question, and we will go to Walt Slaushi for this one. And this is, again, how do you assess how students are interacting with the materials that you provide for them? Well, I would assess that in exactly the same way I assess or would assess if I could see everybody at the, the uh, webinar here by teaching to your eyes, looking at your eyes. With the exception of my neurodiverse, autistic, et cetera, students who may not make eye contact, I'm an openly autistic teacher myself, so I'm always trying to be aware of the fact that attention looks different for other people. But essentially, with most people, if they are looking up, if they're nodding along, and above all, if they are answering with facility and speed when I ask a question, and I ask a million of them, then I'm pretty sure that they are engaged and they are interacting with the material. Um, we also use group created or co-created texts for most of our learning. So this is right from the novice, right from day one, right on up. Um, I'm working from a skeleton of language that I know I want them to get, you know, either today or in the near future. But I don't care what specific direction that conversation or story or whatever goes in. So the students are contributing details and contributing different things. And also in that way, showing me what vocabulary they want in their own lives, which we can then give them. Um, but I'm still driving towards the, the grammar points and the vocabulary that's the core vocabulary for whatever level they're at. It's kind of like a bus. I always say, I'm driving the bus. I don't care what color they paint it but I'm still driving it, you know. Also important for public school because if any of us have taught, I don't know, ninth grade boys, for example, they can lead you into deep water really quickly and you can potentially get in trouble with the administration sometimes over some of the things they would like to talk about. Um, so we talk, we relate things to real life. Um, that's the comparisons on the five C's. So that's really important. And also relating it, and it would be even better with a native speaking teacher who grew up in China, you know, relating it to, gosh, you know, this is something that happened in the U.S. This is how you guys think about it. But this is how we would probably think about this in China, or this is how my mom would think about it or whatever. Um, and we also discuss news items quite a lot, usually first discussing them. Like we had a very interesting discussion, and I know everybody has a polarizing opinion on this. So this was not about the content or the opinions. It was about being able to use language to express your opinions. We talked about Trump's indictment uh, with two of my classes who've had about, I think about 140 hours now. Uh, so we were talking about Trump's indictment and, and that. And then after the discussion was over, we did it with a whiteboard where we could put up new vocabulary and use it, point to it. Then we developed a writing piece you know, collectively, we can do a class writing thing and then move to that for reinforcement. And all the time I'm asking comprehension questions and I'm asking for quick interprets, not translation. Believe me, I've been a translator for a long time. Translation means putting your behind down in the chair and working hard to write things out. Interpretation is very natural. It's just my saying, hey, what did I just say? Tell me in your, your best language, the language that comes out of your mouth the easiest. You know, and that gives me a little window into their minds. What were they thinking at that moment? And that way I can give immediate feedback, maybe not to that student because I don't really do direct correction, but as a class in general, I know, hmm, note to self, need to go over that piece with more input. So essentially, just like I would in conversation, I'm judging my listeners of who there might be 30 or 35, but that's fine. Um, that's what we do. And just trying to make sure that they're with it and making exceptions for those children or, or students who don't show active listening in the same way. I've had autistic kids who in my classes who've had their head down the whole semester and they still acquired. Not as well, perhaps, or as completely as some of the others, but they did acquire language, significant language. So, you know, again, I don't know the answer, but that's what I do. 
And I love that analogy of I am driving the bus, but I don't care what color the class painted. And it is so true. Not every class is going to interact with things in the same way. And not everyone will acquire the knowledge in the same way. And not everyone will reach the same level of proficiency, but we're giving them the content, we're interacting and we're making progress. I love it. Thank you. So same question again, and we will pass to Wang Laoshi for this one. And this, again, the question is, how do you assess student interaction with materials, how they're using it, and how they're working with it? Okay. Um, so for a um, Chinese conversation class, um, I would assign like a two conversation topics for students to study on their own first, um, uh, and then have them to take an online quiz as assessment. Um, and then that way I can, I will know exactly how well they master the content and what questions they have. And they also get an immediate feedback from the online quiz that uh, which part they did well, which part they didn't do well. Um, and the, before they attend a uh, conversation practice as a group. Um, and then I'll, you know, during the conversation practice on Zoom, uh, I'll first ask them about their, you know, kind of the uh, practice experience. And um, um, I'll give them a chance to kind of uh, interact with each other and it, so I can correct them during that process and give them the immediate feedback uh, how you, you, you cannot use it this way or um, the pronunciation is not, not quite correct or you know sometimes it's a more individual, it's the student's uh, um, uh, habit uh, pronouncing certain things so that uh, causing a you know a problem in their accuracy in pronunciation. So those are a very one-on-one -on -one kind of uh, feedbacks to help them improve. Uh, and after that, um, uh, I'll have them to do a small video project. And this is really just an individual. Um, so in this video project, a student can choose to work with a partner or they want to uh, work by themselves. Uh, as some students, uh, uh, a lot of my students have a full-time job. So um, they would choose to uh, work by themselves instead of have a, a high schooler be their partner. <laughs> so, um, so I give them the options and they will need to demonstrate how to fluently and accurately and appropriately use the five to 10 year words and grammar patterns in a conversation, um, which will cover the main content of the lesson. Um, and let me post, you know, there's a demo I made for my um, uh, SIG group. Um, so if you want to know more information, you can uh, click on this link and there are several uh, videos to show how I uh, kind of teach online and with some examples there. Excellent. And I love that you recognize that not all students are going to have the same experience and you kind of give them the option to work independently. I can certainly vouch for someone who does have a full-time job and is on the grad school track. We love that flexibility. So thank you for that. Excellent. And then passing the questions, definitely not least, but we'll move to uh, Peng Lao Shi, passing that same question on to you. And again, the question is, how do you assess student interaction with those materials that you give them? Thank you. Uh, I uh, concur with uh, the what most of the points the panelists are bringing up. Um, I would like to uh, mention two things. Number one is I early on when I was teaching online, I created a lot of uh, videos, tutorials for students to watch before they finish exercises or be, uh, before they come to the um, synchronous meetings. And the students didn't watch them. I can see their click rate. I can see they probably spent two seconds, 10 seconds on a, uh, the videos. I spent hours and hours developing. So they are not watching them. So later on, I used um, Articulate Storyline to create, to recreate my tutorials and uh, require that uh, they complete the comprehension check questions. Uh, it went okay, uh, a little better than the first version. And then these days, I'm also using AdPuzzle, um, which is similar to uh, PlayPosit. Or these days, there, are, uh, there is another one uh, called FluentKey.com. So they have a lot of language materials. So um, you can uh, use some of the videos and create uh, comprehension checks. So that's one change or one thing I noticed that's uh, more effective than simply uh, videos to present the uh, materials. And uh, so that's one way to assess uh, students' interaction with uh, materials. Uh, the second point I would like to uh, mention is the types of questions matter. 
and the, the sequencing of uh, questioning uh, matter. Uh, the questions, for example, based on the text or ba based on the facts uh, can be included in the uh, add puzzle videos to check comprehension. But at the same time, I usually ask students to um, about uh, informational questions about themselves to engage them. And then they need to bring the uh, answers uh, either in the Google form or in some of the survey or slido.com. Sometimes we do some of the survey in class. Uh, so students have a, um, they each have different um, answers to the same question. So that's kind of a warm up uh, comprehension check and also interaction piece. Um, I agree with uh, Jin Lao Shi on the uh, floor and the ceiling questions. Uh, so some of the questions, oh, I, I usually go to uh, little questions um, uh, and then which, which they can do themselves most of the time, whether or not they are good readers or uh, readers need uh, some, some help. Uh, I ask them some inferential questions or evaluative questions, uh, evaluation questions. Um, then I assign them into um, groups so they can discuss their answers with the peers before I provide feedback. I think that's very helpful. Uh, once we finish the questions, then it always goes back to the tasks, just like uh, what the uh, other panelists are mentioning. It always goes to the application. Uh, what can we do with the, uh, the materials or the points we learned from the, uh, from the materials? So that's um, my two points. Excellent. And again, kind of letting the students show you well, what are you taking with it? And I like that way to kind of assess getting that right from them, kind of taking it right from the student. Love it. Fantastic. So uh, we are up at about, well, I'm in the East Coast, so I have uh, 412 my time. I would like to just take a quick pause. Um, so coming back uh, 17 minutes after the hour, so about 417, uh, we'll start back up again and uh, we'll do uh, another question or two and then we'll kind of get into the Q&A at that point. So uh, 17 after the hour, we'll come back, take a quick little break, stretch your, fill up your water cup, and we'll come back for the next part of our session. Thank you, everyone. We'll come back in a little bit. For those of you just coming back, welcome. We have just come back from our break and just had a little refresher. And now we're going to go ahead and start into the second part of our discussion today. And we'll move on to another question uh, that I think is very important to consider whenever we are working with a wide variety of different resources and maybe trying some things a little bit outside of our comfort zones in some cases even. And the question is, how do you weed out the weed, so to speak, whenever there's a lot of noise out there in terms of different types of resources, if this is something that my students are actually using or they're doing well with, or how do you decide if a resource just doesn't make the cut or how do you decide if something is good and it's something you wanna keep around with you? And uh, Wang Laoshi, let's start with you on that question. So how do you go through the material, weed out what's not working and decide what you're going to keep, what is good and working for you? Um, so if a website or tools that's developed for educators, uh, I tend to use uh, those first, um, you know, over, uh, you know, those uh, advertisement free, um, you know, tools or website. Because um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, free videos on YouTube and social media, but uh, they run a different business model. And oftentimes they, those business models uh, run a comp uh, a conflict has a conflict with uh, what we're trying to do, our educational purposes. Uh, so even those content is excellent and they are very well developed. But if the business model of the developer sets a conflict, I would weed them out. Uh, definitely, you don't want your student to learn a few sentences, but end up uh, you know spending a few hours on video games. Uh, you know to reach the educational goal, I prefer to using the tools designed for uh, educators only. I can give you some examples. Uh, for example, uh, Duolingo has a non-educational version, right? And those are free. A lot of people use it. Um, and like a lot of business people, so they they find think it's very handy. Um, but if how, how they uh, earn money is they run those, uh, you know, uh, commercials, right? And every few minutes, uh, if you want to reach the next level, you have to, you're forced to watch these commercials, right? And sometimes again and again and again. Uh, if you're using that kind of uh, type of, you know, tools for uh, your language class, uh, the problem is 
um, you know, when you reach the, try to reach the next level, the students are forced to watch those video game commercials and then they end up get, you know, um, distracted from their learning, you know, goals and they end up, you know, playing those video games, right? And that's not what you want to run into. So, um, so uh, I try to, you know, kind of weed out those um, that has a pop-up, you know, uh, commercials. If you have to use uh, YouTube, uh, you know, there's a way to filter out, you know, the commercials before embedding the video into your uh, content management system. And you can kind of just uh, Google or YouTube, you know, um, how to filter out the commercials. And there's videos to tell you how to do that. And um, there's a lot of videos on that, uh, talking about that. So, so um, uh, that's, you know, um, just from, you know, finding resources online and uh, what I find, you know, very useful. You do bring up a good point. A lot of those uh, free resources out there are actually just sales funnels. And we kind of have to be mindful about what we're sending our students to. So that's definitely a good way to kind of filter out what I'm going to keep versus what I will let go. Thank you for those insights. Uh, Walt Slaushi, we'll pass that question back to you. And this is, again, kind of talking about weeding out the weeds. There's so much information out there. There's a lot of it's noise. How do you decide what you want to keep versus what you want to let go? Oh, yeah. We have come so far from the days back when the Earth's crust was cooling when I was in college learning Chinese. And we had to go across Chinese people riding the DC subway to try to get them to speak Chinese to us, you know. And now... Really, if you don't learn Chinese, it's because you haven't been on the internet. There's so much stuff there. Um, but as far as me as a CI teacher, I'm going to try to keep my students in bounds. In other words, I'm going to try to keep them developing the language that they have already got rather than trying to stretch it out. I want to go narrow and deep, lots of repetition, lots of different contexts with the same language in it. So same words, same structures. Um, so my first criterion is, is a resource going to facilitate correct input for them? So it could be oral, oral input, just listening or something like that, or it could be text, but hopefully with pronunciation linked to it. As a foreigner, I can tell you that if I read a text and there's no pronunciation linked to it, I'm dead in the water if I'm a learner. I mean, after 40 some years, I can usually limp along now, but still there are times I can't. So that's really important. But at the same time, I don't want my students to be having pinion on characters because these are foreign eyes right here. These eyes grew up with ABC. They did not grow up with ding and whatever other radicals you wanna name. So my students' eyes and mine will go to that pinion no matter what. We can't help it. Even if we don't want to, I can't help it. I just read the pinion. So I don't want to ever make them have to spend that energy to avoid that. Um, I want to make it so that they've read so much at things that are at or below their level that there's no point in using opinion. It's easier to just read the characters. That's what I'm hoping. Um, also, I want to give them resources that are appropriate to their level. An example is I use mdbg.com as a translator. It's a professional level, you know, very broad database type dictionary. But when you put a single word in there, you're going to get 26, 30, 50 entries. And that's not practical for a learner. It's, it's too much. And plus, you go off in all these rabbit holes where, oh, look, it also means, you know, a rare type of uh, sleigh bell produced during the late Qing dynasty or something. And they get all excited about this and go down a rabbit hole. So instead of that, I'm going to rec recommend something more like using Pleco, which is the best thing ever. I've had it ever since it was out on Palm Pilot. And a dictionary add in like the Tuttle Learners Chinese English Dictionary, which has fabulous examples. They're very, very beginner friendly examples. Um, so that's going to help them more with making sense of the language they're finding in there than perhaps a more general or a higher level dictionary. My I focus primarily on novices and intermediate level. So I'm not teaching AP. It's, you know, AP teachers experiences are going to be different. Um, I love a resource that allows me to add my own lists or my own text uh, that the resource will then do all kinds of things with that. So I get, you know, uh, what do they say? E, uh, e de, right? I, I have to write one text and then I get a whole bunch of benefits from that text that they can use it in different ways. Um, because that way, you know, I'm not working so hard. 
Same thing when I'm looking for video clips, for example, if I'm going to picture talk a video clip using screenshots from it and then narrate it at the end when they've gotten the new language, I'm gonna look for a clip that allows me to prep the same clip for three different levels of class. And that saves huge amounts of time in preparing visuals and things like that while still allowing you to not only differentiate if you've got that heritage speaker in the class that needs a little more language to keep him happy, you know, or if you're in a higher level and you've got some kids that had a shakier foundation and need a little more support. I hope that made sense. It makes perfect sense. And I really love the idea of using the same content and just popping whatever the student needs, whatever the level that the groups are at, and then giving that scaffolding as well. I absolutely love that. That's definitely something to consider. Truly working smarter, not harder. Anything that we can do with that as educators, we want to leverage that for sure. Thank you. And the same question will pass to Peng Lao Shi. And the question again was, whenever you're working with resources with students, how do you kind of weed out the weeds, decide what you're going to keep, what you'll have them use versus the stuff that you're going to let go and kind of go by the wayside? Uh, yes, I think um, to the, the measurement will be effectiveness, right? Is it effective or is it not effective? Does it have a high return on investment of time and energy? Uh, but that question, I usually leave it to the students uh, because it truly depends on how they use the resources. Is it for language practice? Is it for, um, for example, to, to get uh, more authentic materials? to uh, for in, uh, language input, or is it to uh, foster their interpersonal skills or intake of the language, for example, to um, use, um, was it HelloTalk or some of the apps students use for language partners. Um, and sometimes they use it for uh, uh, chat GPT, for example, for the quality output, uh, especially in my uh, intermediate and advanced level students, they say, okay, this is the essay I wrote, and uh, can you give me some feedback or can you give me an uh, enhanced version? So it depends on uh, what they use the uh, app or the resources for. Some students, especially in summertime or wintertime, they use it just for leisure. And even between classes, they turn on the uh, YouTube videos, they're dancing, they're, uh, you know, uh, they are just uh, showing me or share, sharing with their classmates the music they are listening to. So I think um, the, the return on investment really goes back to the purpose of using the resources. So if uh, the individual students have to make that decision. So that's my two cents. I agree. And not every student is going to do well with this resource and another resource that another student despises might absolutely love that resource. So I love how it's a little bit more student driven. Fantastic. Thank you. And Jin Laoshi, we'll pass to you. And again, the question was talking about working with resources. How do you weed out the weeds, keep the content that's good and kind of decide what you'll let go of? Uh, thank you for the question. I have learned so much from, you know, uh, Lao Shiman. Um, I think I want to just share my personal journey. At the beginning, I just grabbed whatever I heard. You know, I saw a, uh, a post on, I'm talking about at the beginning of the Zoom year. I heard uh, an app, you know, on um, Twitter. I just, you know, oh, I need to try this. And then a teacher friend recommended another one. I just jumped to another one. But eventually I just told myself, no, 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 this is too much. I'm overwhelming myself and I'm going to overwhelm my students. So I think um, this is what I do. First, definitely I'm going to ask around for recommendations from my teacher colleagues. So, because you know we're in the same field, if they speak highly about an app, it, it's worthwhile to just check it out, right? And next one is, I think I'm going to try it myself because I think, um, you know, each language is different. There are certain apps might work well for certain languages, but might not work well for Chinese. And definitely the third criteria I have is I want to see how many, uh, how many communication modes this app can work on. So just say if I know I need one for presentational speaking, 
But can I have an app that can have multiple, you know, uh, activities belonging to multiple uh, modes? And I personally like um, an app called Story Jumper. Uh, number one, it's free. <laughs> Of course, we will always look for free apps, right? So number one is free. And number two, uh, it sounds like um, this, um, book creator, like presentational writing app. Yes, it has that function. But at the same time, I figured out we can also use this app for interpretive and interpersonal. So I was really happy I used that a lot. And um, okay, and um, I think, if you don't mind, I want to, can I share screen just very quickly talking about um, some resources? My Please go ahead, absolutely. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, give me one second and here it is. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, can you see my screen well? Yes, okay, so, uh, Chinese Language Association for Secondary and Elementary Schools uh, is a, a nation, uh, national uh, teachers association for K-12 teachers. And we have a YouTube channel. And actually the first video was posted on March 15th, 2020. And so far we have already uploaded 116 videos. And I want to actually share this with you. If you come over here to the video, um, um, oh, we have a lot, but look at the most popular one here. If I go through this, do you see how many different apps we're talking about here? From uh, um, Canvas to a uh, Game Kit, Story, I talk about Story Jumper here. Think Lincoln virtual um, classroom near part. It's just basically all the major uh, tech tools being used uh, for online teaching were introduced uh, in the channel. And if you come here, you can definitely take a look. And so in Story Jumper, when I introduced Story Jumper, uh, I share with the audience that, of course, you can use it as a um, presentational writing tool. But I think what I like the most is this uh, app allows students to do collaboration. Uh, say if one student is staying at his home and another student is staying at her home, they can still join this app and do a collaborative work project. I think that's really solved my problem because how do I group them together, put them together, you know, to work on one thing. And also, uh, of course, this app has a function to record. So I just designed one activity so students can say one student record on one slide, one slide or one frame, and the other student uh, can come to and listen to the recording and then uh, record the answer on the next uh, slide or frame. So that's a, like interpersonal in a way. That was what I can find close enough to, you know, true interpersonal. And also for interpretive, I can upload a screenshot of a reading piece and give students comprehension questions and they can type out their answer on Story Jumper. So, for, I mean, this, um, this app was introduced actually by my Japanese teacher colleague. And I, I really, really like it. And back to your question, I went through a lot of apps and eventually I think I just cut down a lot of you know, um, apps and focus on just a few more. And I think I'm right now I'm using uh, Adpostle for interpretive listening, <laughs> you know, reading and um, Seesaw is the one I use the most for presentational speaking. And I think uh, I still use Nearpod once in a while. Uh, another app I use a lot is Padlet. This is for students to share ideas and you know brainstorm and share ideas. And also you can do interpersonal uh, writing on that app. So 
hoping to answer the question. Very much so. You did bring up a really good point about how we have to be mindful about quantity as well, because if we're using too many things, even if they're good, it can cause our students to get a little bit overwhelmed and that might make them disengage, which we definitely want to avoid. I love that you also mentioned Padlet, um, which is kind of a little good segue into just a friendly reminder about our session today. Um, as we are getting to the point where we're getting ready to wrap up, um, please keep in mind if you are planning on earning the digital badge and or the potential for earning a CEU, just depending on your particular qualifications and, and what your, your district and, and what area needs for those CEUs. What I'm trying to say is we can't necessarily guarantee you, unless you're with NC Virtual, we can guarantee you the CEUs. So just, if you do want that CEU, please check and make sure that you are gonna be eligible to use that. But uh, we will be using Padlet as part of our collaboration. I'm hoping to get a lot of interaction going between everyone. This is a fantastic group. And at this point, I do want to just take the remaining minutes to open things up to questions. I would warmly invite our audience, if you have questions, if you even would like to turn on your web camera and your audio, your microphone, and speak directly with our panel, we would warmly invite you to do so. And we just kind of want to open things up for questions at this time. <laughs> 